Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the symposium. Um, we are going to start the symposium uh, with a talk uh, by my good friend, Arash Afraz. Uh, Arash received his medical degree from Tehran University of Medical Sciences. He did his PhD in psychology department at Harvard University under the supervision of Patrick Kavanaugh. He then joined MIT as a postdoc in Jim DiCarlo's lab. Since 2017, he's a principal investigator at uh, National Institute of Health. In terms of his research, uh, Arash has done and is continuing to do a fantastic research at the intersection of physiology and psychology. He mainly uses perturbation techniques such as microstimulation, pharmacological inactivation, and optogenetics to investigate how the activity patterns, mainly in the IT cortex of monkey, relate to perception and behavior. Uh, he will talk about some of his uh, recent findings in this talk, I think, and we are eagerly looking forward to hear his talk. So, Arash, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can, Reza. Okay, great. So you can start the, the talk whenever you are ready. Uh, all right, first of all, uh, thanks Reza, it's great to see you. Uh, and it's great to be at least virtually back uh, to Sharif University. Um, uh, <clears throat> so I'll jump right into the uh, talk. Um, do you see my slides? Uh, do you see the slides? I can't hear anyone. Do you hear me? So, uh, just a moment, Arash, we are trying uh -huh. to uh, sure. bring the slides. Sure, sure. So, so one little thing. Uh, since, since when I go into the presentation mode, I can't see anyone and I don't get any feedback, it feels like recording a podcast. Uh, I would appreciate if someone uh, be online so to give me like verbal feedback at least. Yeah, I can do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, Arash. There is a yeah. Uh, we didn't. Uh, we couldn't see your slides, but uh, it's yeah. okay right now. Okay. Can you see? Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. All right. Excellent. So, does perception exist? Uh, Perception is something that people talk about, and it is one of those uh, words borrowed from common uh, common English, and uh, it is not clearly defined what we are talking about when we say perception. From uh, some people's point of view, perception is something uh, that is subjective and cannot be scientifically interrogated. Uh, for other people's point of view, it is a matter of uh, behavior and behavior can actually constrain perception. So I want to start my talk with one simple question from uh, the uh, people who are sitting there. Uh, Reza, can you take a, 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 a poll there? Uh, if, if you have ever seen in your life a rectangular door, raise your hand. Reza, can you tell me what proportion are raising their hands? Uh, so 
We have about, I don't know, maybe 60, 70 attendees. Excellent. So, so 60, 70 percent uh, say they, they've seen a rectangular door uh, in their life. But what is seeing? If seeing, if, if you want to rigorously define seeing, seeing is about the image that is formed on the back of your retina. And uh, I can confidently claim that none of you and none of us, including myself, have ever seen a rectangular, rectangular door in my life because, because uh, the picture of the door that is cast on the back of my curved retina is never a rectangle. And uh, what we perceive is the rectangular door, is the physical or geometric qualities of the door that is abstracted out from the image by our brain by a function. And uh, now we perceive that, that invariant function, and we sort of confidently report that we have seen rectangular doors. But if we are more careful, we should say we have seen, not seen, but perceived rectangular doors. And that's kind of the link that takes us to measurement of perception. Uh, this is a drawing from uh, René Descartes in Treaties of Man. And uh, here, Descartes shows how the sensory input goes into the eyes and into the brain and leads to the behavioral output. And we are used to studying the sensory input in connection to the behavioral output. Now, where is perception? So we tend to put perception as a bubble, a thought bubble, somewhere in the middle of the head. And uh, I think the, that is exactly how the misunderstanding about perception starts, because this is a Cartesian view of perception. If you think about it carefully, perception is actually a matter of behavior. Perception is a stuff made of behavior. We always know about perception by behavioral report, and that's what we measure about perception. So in that sense, the studying of perception is fundamentally the same as measurement of the muscle movements, uh, the output of the, of the brain function. So a few other words before we dive into the main meat of this uh, talk. Uh, I want to take an example, an analogy from history of physics. Uh, since we are at Sharif University, uh, let's talk a little about physics. Uh, there was this time in physics in late 18th century uh, that there was this field of mechanics that was about how, uh, how solids move and uh, how you basically constrain uh, their movement by physical formula. And uh, there was this other field, separate field of calorics, which is perceived as pseudoscience now, but it was a thing in physics back then. Calorics was the study area of studying temperature, heat, because heat was this phenomenon, this almost magical phenomenon that you could have a hot, hot cup of coffee, stick it to your uh, cold cup of coffee, and then uh, the heat would go from one cup to the other cup and uh, without any of the cups losing weight. So, so this was the separate field and they used to measure temperature with a thermometer. In the area of mechanics, we measured phenomena with a clock, with a meter, and I should have added a scale here to, to measure mass. These are the fundamental measurements of mechanics. These two fields were separate until uh, the rise of thermodynamics, that suddenly we could explain temperature by, uh, by uh, kinetic energy of the atoms in a gas or in an environment. Now we have a scientific explanation that can bond the two to bond the two. We can throw out our thermometers and report heat or temperature as average kinetic energy of the atoms in an environment. Uh, so this is a successful translation or reduction between two fields that are that were different, but then they were unified under the principles of thermodynamics, because now we could explain the higher scale phenomenon based on the lower scale. 
So now the goal, part, part of the goal of cognitive neuroscience is to explain the world of psychology by the world of neurons. We want to, in, the, in vision science, we would like to explain this psychological or behavioral phenomena called perception by the means of neurons. We know how to measure neurons. We have known it for 50 years. Uh, you stick an electrode in the brain and record the electrical potential of the, of the cell membrane. Uh, we measure it basically with, uh, with time. It is in the units is spikes per second. So it is uh, invert of, it, of the time uh, in terms of what, what it is constructed of. Perception is made of what? The problem is that we cannot easily measure perception. And when we cannot measure perception, uh, I think I got, yeah. Uh, when, when we cannot measure perception, are my slides back? Yes, I think you went one slide back. Sure, yeah. So. So, so how do we measure perception? If we want to explain perception by the means of neural activity, how do we measure it? And uh, so, so the way we measure it is usually we pick one dimension, one objective dimension, and we try to use stimuli on the screen to cancel out that effect, the effect of that dimension. For example, there are classical works amazing works by, by uh, Bill Newsom's group, uh, spearheaded by Daniel Salzman, uh, like the slide, like the figure I'm showing on the left, uh, they showed that the stimulation of direction selective neurons in the uh, in cortex, in MT cortex, uh, actually biases perception in favor of seeing motion in the, dire in the preferred direction of the neurons. How did they measure the perceptual bias? By showing a stimuli on the screen and trying to null the effect of that bias. That leads to a shift in a psychometric function and we define perception by that shift. There has been other works regarding this. And uh, uh, yours truly also has been uh, responsible for uh, making the same mistake. Uh, in, 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 uh, by, by measuring perception via one dimension of, of it. In the case, in this case, this is my work, by, my work with, uh, uh, my work in 2006 with, uh, Hossein Esteki and Ruzbek Kiani. Uh, the, uh, we basically measured the face, uh, signal. By, by stimulating the face neurons, we train the monkey uh, to discriminate between faces and non-faces, and we showed that the monkey's psychometric function shifts when you, when you uh, stimulate the face neurons. This means that the stimulus can be a little non-face, and the monkey still perceives it as face. Uh, and so that's basically how we measured uh, perception back then. So, this approach is objective and is useful and has been useful. However, it doesn't capture the uh, higher dimensional aspects of perception. Perception is something complex. For example, in 2006, yes, I could understand that by stimulating face neurons, the monkey is more likely to see something in noise as a face. But I didn't know if that face was a monkey face, was a human face, was, was his aunt's face, was my aunt's face, was, uh, uh, was big, was a small, was a smiling, was angry. I didn't know anything about that face, basically. And, and those details matter. So, so while I was doing this sort of research, and I continued to, that, uh, to do that like uh, in, in my MIT years, actually, uh, this paper came out. Uh, uh, we won't have sound, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain. Many have actually seen this video. This is a paper of a human patient uh, who is being, uh, who is being uh, stimulated in the face selective area. And the patient, uh, when he is not stimulated, but he's told that he's stimulated, he reports, I see nothing. So it's sort of a reliable patient. 
But when they actually stimulate the face area, he reports this really complex distortions on the face of the person, the doctor he's looking at. He says, your face was metamorphosed. You see the uh, subtitles. And uh, he describes strong distortions in face perception. He describes it as a psychedelic trip, actually. So when this paper came out, it was kind of testimony to what, what I want to study is so complex. And I am, uh, I am giving myself these medals by measuring these lower dimensions of perception. And that gave me a midlife crisis uh, in a sense that, in a sense that I felt uh, we are the monkey, my monkey, when we stimulate his face area is having a trip. And now I am just asking the monkey, do you see a male face or a female face? Or do you see a face or non-face? All these boring questions that cannot really capture the sense of what the monkey perceives. So let's make it, uh, let's, let's uh, draw a mathematical uh, or geometric analogy here. Uh, the idea is that imagine uh, perception is a multidimensional uh, uh, thing. It's an object with uh, perhaps uh, hundreds or thousands of dimensions. And when we stimulate the brain, we induce a perturbation in perception, which is represented here by the red vector. Uh, so that's what the, uh, what the animal or the human who is being stimulated perceives. When we re measure perception on one dimension, let's say in my own paper, 2006, but on, on faceness dimension, it is fine, but we are looking at a teeny tiny proportion of the main effect. We are looking at the shadow of the red vector over the axis of measurement that we have. And how lucky should we be to actually be uh, measuring the right, uh, right axis, really? Because, because we don't really know how perception works and how, 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 how the brain works in a deeper sense. So is there a way to measure the red vector directly? Is there a way to know what is it that is induced into perception, into high level object perception uh, in its all glory? Uh, so before, before actually, let me jump over this slide. And, and, and tell you the steps that we took to, to, to achieve this goal. Um, first of all, uh, I, I have to introduce this little toy that we have been playing with for, for a few years now. Uh, this is an, this is an, this is an uh, implantable array of LEDs. We call it the opto array. Uh, this is a board made of, uh, uh, it's the PCB board that has uh, a bunch of, uh, green or blue, depending on the wavelengths we want LEDs on that and a thermal sensor. It's a very simple idea. And we implant this board under, under the dura matter uh, in the, uh, over the cortex of uh, uh, monkeys, or, or it could be used in humans potentially. Uh, the idea is that can we use light to perturb cortex uh, in a high throughput manner? So to do that, we are using uh, optogenetics techniques. So we basically uh, do uh, two complex surgeries to achieve this final implant. First, in the first surgery, we open up the cortex and we inject the cortex with virus. And uh, this virus trans transfects the uh, neurons in the cortex uh, just like your COVID vaccine, basically, it transfers genetic material into your into the neurons of the monkey, and now these neurons produce uh, photosensitive proteins, like the proteins that you have in the back of your eyes, and that makes you see the world because they they are sensitive to photons and turn photons into uh, membrane potential difference. So, so by the use of these viruses, we can turn these cortical neurons, if you will, into retinal neurons that we can play with light. Later, about a month later, we close the monkey, we come back a month later, open up the cortex again, and implant this array of LEDs uh, right on top of the transfected zone. So now you can imagine we have a really low resolution 
poor man's version of a TV on the monkey's cortex. And we can play patterns or we can stimulate points uh, in, in the cortex in a repeated manner, in a high throughput matter, because it is safe, it is light, and it is, uh, it is uh, not invasive. So, so that's the background. The first thing that we decided was that, okay, we cannot study this on humans for obvious reasons. So for the, the human studies remain anecdotal like the case that I showed you. Uh, but when we move to monkeys, they don't even talk. So how can we interrogate the monkey on what the monkey perceives? And moreover, even if we had a talking subject, if it was a human, words are not images we want quantitative measurement of perception so we really want to take a picture of what the monkey or human sees not a description by words so the problem is kind of common between monkey and human there and we figured that for the monkey there is no hope that the monkey can really tell us and describe to us what is it that what that complex thing that he uh, perceives so so we switched to a totally different concept. We uh, borrowed this task. This task has been used in the past by John Mansell, for example. Uh, we named it cortical perturbation detection task. The idea is that the monkey's task is not to tell me anything about what we show him. The monkey's task is to tell me if I stimulated his brain or not. And the monkeys can learn this task really quickly, actually. Uh, it has been shown before, and we repeated that by optogenetics, that if we turn on a light source on the cortex and reward the monkey for detecting that, the monkeys really quickly remember, uh, learn that task. How do they do this task? Uh, this, this plot shows their performance and how the stimulated and non-stimulated trials separate off within only a few days. So, so now we move to the interesting part of this experiment. Uh, this experiment is spearheaded by my great postdoc Reza Azadi. Uh, so, so, so now he's, he did cortical perturbation detection task or the CPD task against image variations. I'll tell you how. So we, we asked the monkey first to fixate on a fixation point, and then we show an image to the monkey. This image could be anything. This image is actually a random, uh, a, a random selection of an object. In this case, it's a picture of a rat. As the monkey fixates on the, on the image, in the middle of image presentation for 200 milliseconds, we roll the dice and with a random function, either zap the cortex or not. Then the, the trial ends and two response targets show at the very end. If the monkey look at the non the top one for trials that we did not stimulate him, we reward him. If the monkey look at the bottom one for the trials that we stimulated him, we reward him. So we know how to reward the monkey because we have the, uh, we have the truth. We know if we stimulated or not. The interesting point is that the monkey can keep up with us. The monkey can learn that task. And how do the monkey learn that task? We hypothesize that the monkey sees something because we are on high level visual cortex and we are stimulating the cortex, the high level visual cortex. So our hypothesis is that the monkey sees something and it sets up this internal criterion that whenever I see this strange thing and I look at the bottom dot, this guy rewards me. And whenever that weird thing doesn't happen and I look at the top button, this guy rewards me. And that's probably how the monkeys learn this. But if this hypothesis is true, if the monkey actually sees something following the stimulation of high level visual cortex, inferior temporal cortex in this case, uh, that thing might interact with what we show on the screen. And this is the idea behind this experiment, that we show different images on the screen and we see if we can vary 
the monkey's performance in detecting his own cortical stimulation. Because remember, detecting cortical stimulation should not depend on the screen. If the monkey closes his eyes, even in, uh, in theory up to this point, he should be able to do that. So why should the stimulation on the screen, the image we show on the screen, affect the performance? This plot shows the results of this experiment. The y-axis is the monkey's performance in detecting cortical stimulation. Uh, it's on D prime. The x-axis is the image index. One of them is a rat, one of them is a cup, one of them is a butterfly, one of them is a, uh, is a flower, whatever, whatever. And it turns out that the choice of image on the screen affects the monkey's performance. Uh, and that was very strange for us, that why should something on the screen make it easier or more difficult for the monkey to detect the stimulation of the cortex. It clearly shows that the monkey is experiencing something visual that interacts with the visual input. But then what is the nature of that interaction? One hypothesis is that the content of the visual image are distorted, like, like the human report that we observed together. The other hypothesis, uh, which is sort of a more standard uh, uh, inferior temporal cortex hypothesis, I call it the labeled line hypothesis, is that if a neuron, for example, is sent selective for a star and you stimulate that neuron, the monkey should see a star because activation of that neuron means always a presence of a star on the retina. So basically we are asking it is the monkey perceiving a distortion or the monkey is perceiving an addition by, by, by stimulation. Here comes another experiment to test these two hypotheses, to separate these two hypotheses. We took one of the images on which the monkey's performance was average and now morphed that image to gray. So on one end of the spectrum, there is a high contrast image on the screen. On the other side of the spectrum, there is no image. Which one do you think is easier for the monkey to detect? So remember, I am the monkey. I look at the screen and you show me nothing on the screen and stimulate my brain. If I see a star, I see a star on a flat screen. It's easier for me to detect it. But if there is that face on the screen, maybe that the star falls over its, its bright parts and I don't see that clearly. So under that hypothesis, we expect the performance to be lower when we have a high contrast image on the screen and higher when we have the white canvas, when we have the flat canvas for the monkey, the blank canvas. If the monkey's perception is the nature of the nature of distortion of the existing image, not some sort of an additive experience, we expect the opposite. We expect an ascending plot. And that's actually what we observe when we measure that. The performance of the monkey is lowest when there is no image on the screen, which is interesting. We repeated this experiment in another set of experiments spearheaded by my other good, great postdoc, Rosa uh, Laffer Souza. And uh, she, what she did was to this time vary the size of the stimulus on the screen because we didn't really believe that result, that if you give the monkey nothing, it would be harder for the monkey to detect cortical stimulation. So now, uh, we showed again that if you if the stimulus on the screen is a small, the monkey has a harder time detecting the stimulation of his cortex. And when the stimulus is larger, it is easier and easier for the monkey to detect cortical stimulation. Strange. So, uh, uh, Reza, can you please tell me how much time do I have? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, we have half an hour left. For including Q and A or without? No, 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 not including Q and A. Not, not including. Am I right? Okay, thank. Okay, thank you. So I've got time. So, so one idea that comes to my mind to uh, and and we need to we need to this is sort of setting up our future direction and I am just pointing to this idea uh, here, because it could be setting up a new way of thinking about 
about uh, uh, coding in, 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 in visual brain is that up to this point, if you asked me when you stimulate a neuron, how the neuron responds to stimulation, I would tell you the neuron would respond. You're artificially stimulating the neuron. Why should it matter what are the state of other neurons in the system? And uh, But now, based on these results, that it seems that sometimes it is harder for the monkey to detect perturbation. Sometimes it is easier. Well, we have to show this little bridge. But it is not a bad assumption to assume maybe the neuron is not responding as much. Because if the, the monkey's downstream is, is tuned to looking at activity of that neuron to perform the perceptual task, now why should the monkey find it harder to detect that activity in one case and not other? One possibility is that the neuron doesn't respond to stimulation as well in, in the two conditions. Uh, based on the push-pull states between neurons, how neurons constrain each other, you can you can imagine that in the neural state space, not all possible, uh, not all uh, states are possible. There is some concept that uh, I don't have time to talk about it today. Uh, Merda Jazieri and I have elaborated on that in our 2017 paper. But the idea is that a lot of the state space of neurons is in permissible space because neurons have inhibition and excitation on top of each other. And uh, it is, so, so parts of the neural space is not permissible. And now, is it possible that variation of neuron 2 affects perturbability of neuron 1? And if that's true, that's, that could be an interesting key about how object perception works in the brain. I don't talk more about this at this point. I just wanted to drop it in your minds that there might be some interesting physiology undergoing the effect that we observe so far. But before getting distracted with that physiology, I wanted to go back to our original question. Now that we know the image on the screen interacts with the monkey's perception and the effects of brain stimulation, do we have a hope at capturing what is it that the monkey perceives? Can we take a picture of what the monkey perceives? This sounds schizophrenic or sounds uh, philosophically, uh, philosophically uh, uh, heretical, if you will, uh, because perception is a subjective experience. So how can you take a picture of that? But if you remember from at the beginning, I mentioned perception is stuff made of behavioral reports. So it's actually not subjective. It is objective. And I'm going to show you how can we capture perception in terms of a photograph, which is an objective measure. So so here is the set of experiments we did. Uh, uh, it's called, uh, we, we named the technique perceptography. Uh, the experiments are spearheaded by wonder, my wonderful postdoc, Ilya Shahbazi, who is a graduate of Sharif University, actually. And uh, so the paper is in publication in press in Nature Communications. Hopefully it will come out within the next couple of months, uh, but I can tell you the main results. So the idea is that now we do the same task, the, uh, the perturbation detection task uh, for the monkey uh, and, and get the monkey to fixate at the screen. Now we show a picture, let's say in this case, the picture of Mona Lisa. And now the monkey is supposed to do the same task, right? And the monkey does the same task and easily do the task, but then we cheat. The idea is that at the time of cortical stimulation, we go in and actually change the image on the screen, a random image perturbation. So bear with my wishful mind for a second that if, if I knew what is it that the monkey perceived, for example, if Mona Lisa was dis distorted in exactly the same way I am showing in this slide, and I swapped Mona Lisa with that picture, the monkey would mistakenly take that as brain stimulation, even if I didn't stimulate his brain. 
So the idea is that if I if I knew what is it that the monkey perceive, and I swap that by uh, swap the image uh, at the time of stimulation, when I don't stimulate, you know, in some trials I don't stimulate, the monkey would think this is a stimulated trial. Okay, so this seems sounds like a little bit of wishful thinking to know what that image is, right? Good luck finding that. There are thousands of dimensions Mona Lisa can change. Uh, but, but we have an objective test now. If and if we get close to that image, the monkey will false alarm. The monkey will mistakenly think unstimulated trials are stimulated. And the monkey has no other option other than that because the monkey wants to do the task and receives reward. So, so, so the monkey is kind of cornered to do this for us. Okay, how do we get to that image? Uh, now it's, it's a search problem. There is, a, there is an ocean of images that we have to search in there. First, we have, we have two AI engines that do this search for us. One of them we call Da Vinci. Da Vinci is a GAN, is a generative adversarial neural network that creates two images at two layers. It's a, it's a sophisticated system. We, uh, we don't have time to dive into that, but the details are in the paper and you can find it on BioArchive here with the QR code. But Da Vinci is a system that takes the base image, in this case, Mona Lisa, and perturbs it, mutates the image, and let's say make a thousand mutations of Mona Lisa. And we throw them at the monkey one by one, and the monkey answers to all of them. So the monkey's task, remember, is to ignore those perturbations and report to us only really when his brain was stimulated. So now there is a second AI system it is a deep neural network we called Ahab. It's an optimizer. The name Ahab comes out of, uh, after, uh, this is Ilya's uh, 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 idea. Uh, it's a good idea. It comes after Captain Ahab uh, in Moby Dick uh, because uh, Ahab is in this, in this ocean of images and image perturbations. Ahab is in search of Moby Dick. Moby Dick is the image perturbation fools the monkey into thinking he's stimulated is the image that the monkey perceives so now the monkey and ahab and da vinci work together for thousands and thousands and thousands of trials and this cycle continues for average of 40,000 behavioral trials and remember with that optogenetic array we can easily go to these numbers so, so now the monkey trains Da Vinci and Ahab to fool him. So uh, Ahab is basically, uh, uh, oh, there is uh, this thing. Actually, let's move on from this. We don't need to talk about that. Um, the, you know, the idea is that, uh, let, me, let me say it. I guess I have some time. So, so one, 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 one problem we had with designing Da Vinci was that, yes, of course, you can create infinite number of images uh, by almost any image generation engine. But we had this notion called porosity, uh, which is the idea is that if I determine what image you make for me, can you make that? How close to that can you get? So imagine I determine, because, because we want to mimic images in perception, and we don't know what they are. So Da Vinci should be able to create any image. The space of images that it can create should not be porous, should be dense. And the way we measure that is, uh, is that, uh, like here on the right, you see some wild images and how they are mimicked uh, by, by the system, which is not that bad. This is began, this is not Da Vinci. Da Vinci steps one more, uh, one step higher, and we kind of try to do images that are outside its learn training set. So some of these are bronze work that I have done. So I know no one has put a picture of that darn thing on, uh, on the internet. And we got the uh, Da Vinci to mimic them for us. And this is the resolution of the mimic, right? So you can think about it as the resolution of the picture we are taking from perception. It is not perfect. Uh, so, so the first day is quite interesting. The first day, remember, the monkey was trained on a task 
that uh, basically looks at a solid image and detects the stimulation. So the monkey's internal rule should be any image change means I should look at the bottom, bottom dot, right? But in the second day, all images have image changes in them. The monkey's rule is more difficult to, re to, to, to look for the image change that comes from brain, brain stimulation. And it is interesting, when you put these monkeys uh, on, on the first day of showing dynamic images, you kind of see this interesting rise on false alarm rates. Uh, the x-axis is the trial number, the y-axis is false alarms. The number of times the monkey said, you stimulated me, but we didn't stimulate him. So as you see, when the monkey is looking at static images, no change images, false alarm rate is quite low. But then as soon as we introduce image perturbation, the false alarm rate skyrockets to high numbers and remains high. And these are mistakes by the monkey and we don't reward them because the monkey should not say yes for any image uh, perturbation. But this clearly shows that the monkey would see an image change in the static image so that the monkey is now taking image perturbation as, as that. But now, after some trials, uh, after about like 700, 800 trials, the monkey's false alarm rate drops and the monkeys learn the new task. The new task is not to respond to any image perturbation, only the one that comes from your brain stimulation and don't get fooled by, by, by that brain stimulation. Um, let's move on from this. So now, now, we have one problem. If this protocol works, now if we kind of find the image that the monkey perceives and the monkey says yes and we don't reward him. So we will be untraining the monkey. So how can we keep the incentive for the monkey to perform this task with high accuracy? And but, uh, what we do is that as we go forward, we dilute the images with just random Da Vinci images. So we always have this big pool of random Da Vinci images and we track only a small proportion of those images by Ahab and Ahab optimi optimization algorithm. That turns into even more trials and more wasted trials. But then we realized that among these images, the two colors are two monkeys, two different monkeys, and the y-axis is the false alarm rate and x-axis is basically time. And we realized that while the monkey's performance is high, the monkey's per, uh, false alarm rate is quite low on Da Vinci images. On Ahab images, we are starting to elevate uh, on false alarm rate. Basically, we can trick the monkey by making some changes in the image that Ahab is kind of learning from Da Vinci and from, sorry, from the monkey's behavior. Uh, we can actually increase the false alarms, right? Because remember, Ahab knows what Da Vinci has done to an image and knows that, let's say, that image Da Vinci created induced 2% more false alarm in monkey. Now Ahab goes back to Da Vinci and tells Da Vinci, hey, give me, give me more, uh, more uh, mutations from that image family. And this cycle continues. And now we see Ahab images are getting better and better in inducing false alarms. We can induce false alarms with image changes. This is another way of looking at this data. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a dendrogram, a way that you typically uh, show like virus evolution, like you have seen stuff like this in COVID virus evolution plots. So, so on the y-axis, there are thousands of uh, Da Vinci images, the first generation Da Vinci images. They are different on multi dimensions, on thousands of dimensions. So they cannot be sorted on one axis. So to, to sort them on one axis, we basically sorted them based on pixel distance from the base image. So you see that they're all variations of pixel distance images as well. And then any image that induces false alarm more than the baseline is sniffed out by Ahab. And now Da Vinci makes two children for that image. So that image and two of its children, mutated children, will make it to the next generation. And so on and so on and so on. Now here, let's take a look at one example of such images. The base image is the image on the lower 
left of the plot uh, with the star. Uh, it's again generated nonsense image. It's a finger on top of a bunch of towels. And then, well, we don't, I can't show you all of the image, thousands and thousands of the mutations, but five are shown here. And you can see the one that has this baby looking thing has created more false, more false alarms. If you look at the lines of the dendrogram, and if you look at the bottom right of the plot, there is an indicator that this shows the thickness of the purple line is, uh, uh, indicates the proportion of false alarms. Uh, now, as you see, as the image is, uh, is mutated and changed uh, uh, during this e evolution, it eventually transformed to a weird image. We'll see bigger picture of that. That weird image, we call it a perceptogram because that is an image that in most cases, in this case, in 88% of the trials, induces false alarms. Or in other words, the monkey cannot tell the difference between the state of being stimulated and the state of looking at this image. Percepto, so the name perceptogram. Um, the, let's skip this. Let's take a look at a couple of perceptograms. Uh, many of them are actually like noise looking. They are very specific, but noise looking. And that makes sense in a sense that when you randomly stimulate a point in IT cortex, for most images, you are pushing, pushing the image into a nonsense area, actually, because it is uncoordinated with the natural manifold of image response. This cat image is an example. There is the seed image of a cat. And when we stimulate one point in IT cortex, that per perceptogram comes out. Remember, the patterns on the cat's face are look, they look random and they are random in a sense, but they are not random in a sense that if I change them, the monkey will not be fooled by this image. The monkey will realize that this is not the brain stimulation and do the task right, won't false alarm. Like that pink scratch, that pink, uh, pink uh, uh, line on the oblique line on the bottom of the, uh, the one of the cheeks of the cat, if you move that, the monkey notices you're not stimulating him. So it's a very a specific pattern of noise, which is repeated for the monkey. But some of them are meaningful. Some of them are interest, interesting and are doing things that are not related to kind of what I would think IT would do. Uh, for example, this monkey image, this is another point in the cortex. When you stimulate the cortex, that base image of a monkey turns into more or less the same monkey with the head turned like five degrees and the hair grown long and blonde. This is another one of my favorites. This is an interesting, very interesting case that this stimulation leads to a very sudden change. Uh, this is a dog. And remember, we try all images until we arrive at the perceptogram. We try, a, not all images, a rich image space. Uh, this one turns into that. It's as if the dog has point, pointed his tongue out. And uh, we repeated this with, with a dog that was triple in size and the tongue was re-emerged in the, in the new place of the mouse of the dog. It's a very interesting case. Uh, this is another one. This is the perceptogram of that finger at actually higher stimulation power, uh, which leads to this picture. And uh, it's, uh, some people see a tongue here in this picture. Uh, it's not clear what that is, but, but you can describe it as a three-eyed face with a tongue. And it's interesting to know that this is the perceptogram coming from the same point in the cortex that the dog came in. Uh, so, so, so as you see, the distortions are very image dependent, uh, but at the same time, at least in this one case, there is this interesting commonality uh, between them. Uh, we did another test in which we uh, changed the intensity of the stimulation on the cortex. We hypothesized that if we are really taking a picture of perception, like, uh, so if we stimulate the cortical stimulation, the perceptual distortions should be bigger and we should see bigger changes. 
And that happened exactly. And with higher stimulation power, we saw more, 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 uh, more distortion of the perceived image. And on the heat maps, you see that there is, uh, there is a sort of a hotter heat map. This is another example of the same seed image uh, that we stimulated along the cortex on different points. And it was interesting because on the posterior parts of cortex, when we stimulated, uh, we saw these noise patterns added to the image. As we went to the anterior part of the cortex, the base image is still changed. If you compare them, they are different. On pixel base, uh, they are very different, actually. But they they become more vivid uh, the, and, and uh, they kind of remained on their conceptual manifold, which is quite strange. So we are at this stage of this study now. Uh, we think that we have broken a dam, uh, which was this idea that measurement of perception was not possible or if it was, it was very impoverished is not the case anymore. Perceptography can open that gate for us. We can peek into perceptual experience. And now we are looking forward to the next uh, next uh, step of the game, which is recording the neural activity underlying these perceptual distortions and hopefully making the final attempt at bridging the gap between perception and neural activity. Uh, let's do the conclusions together at Q&A, and here I use the opportunity to uh, thank my uh, great uh, lab, uh, lab, lab members, and also thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks a lot, Orash. Very interesting stuff. Um, so if anyone have questions. Uh, you can uh, raise your hands uh, to ask your questions or you can write them down in Farsi if you prefer to. We can also have some questions online, yes? Okay. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Thanks, Arash, for a great talk, as always. Uh, what do you think of, of doing the same experiment in MT? Because we believe that we know what MT neuron does, but we believe that we don't have, we don't have any idea what IT does. What do you think if you implant a monkey with MT, LED array? Do you think you can replicate the same experiment and the micro team of Dan Salzman? Well, uh, first of all, I should say in science, I never, ever, never use that verb believe. Uh, I personally think the uh, verb believe uh, should be saved only for romantic context. Uh, but uh, in science, I don't believe in anything. Uh, so, uh, so the case of Daniel Salzman's results, I actually, I am very curious to, uh, to, to do that in MT cortex. We are kind of, we've got a lot to do in, in, uh, in ventral stream now, actually, because we are doing it in area V4 too. And I kind of like to go to new territories, but I believe that should be done in MT cortex again, because remember, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there were a lot of uh, interesting aspects of MT stimulation that has not been reported in Salzman uh, report because they measured, they had this impoverished tool for measuring perception. And as I mentioned, yes, uh, you can measure the projection of the perceptual vector on your measurement axis, and that's what they did. And let's hope that is absorbing most of the variance of the original vector, but I am not sure if that's the case. So we got to do it again. We have to, we have to, we have to measure it with a better technique, with a stronger technique, and see what happens. I would be really surprised if we don't find anything new. Thank you. Sure. So, Arash, the person who asked the question was Mehdi Sanayi. Uh, did you recognize him? No, I didn't see him. Hey, Mehdi, how are you doing? Oh, I can see you now. So, any more questions?
Uh, I can actually take this time to ask a question and also make a comment. There is, there is no question. I can. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so Arash, uh, my question is kind of technical in nature. I mean, yeah, my first question. So, uh, you implant arrays, the opto arrays, uh, only on one hemisphere of the monkey, yes? No, two hemispheres. So we, we use we use them one of them as a control basically. We implant on one side and we implant on the other side without virus injection. <clears throat> because because we have to make sure the monkey is not detecting light in the in the in the head. Uh, so we okay. kind of use that as a control. But the, but the, uh, the simulation the is one-sided. Yeah, the simulation is yes. in one side. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So, uh, given the contralateral representation in IT cortex, uh, shouldn't we have distortions only on one side of the image? If the perceptograms are really what the monkeys perceive. Uh, the perceptogram should show only distortion in one side, not the, not on the entire image. Yes, it's a very good question. Actually, thanks for asking. We, we are looking for that effect actually, and we see hints of that. Uh, the one issue is that we've got a small dynamic range because these images are four by four, uh, so so we are not we, we cannot modify it like bigger 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 sizes so a lot of it falls in that overlap area and uh, but but this is a very relevant question and uh, i think uh, I, I think we need more we need larger images and more of them to be able to address that there are hints of that though okay uh, so you postpone the answer to future yeah 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 you got to wait <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so are there questions? If not, I can continue with comments. Okay. Uh, ah, one question, yes. Okay. Um, thank you for your uh, excellent and educated lecture. Can you lecture. speak louder? What? Uh, thank you for your uh, excellent and educative lecture. Um, I have a question. Uh, as we know, perception is a complex concept. Uh, how did you make sure that uh, we exclude all uh, other factors? For example, the effect of other senses on the perception of the monkey or um, how can we make sure that this perception is the only perception that the monkey gets? For example, today, uh, there are um, multiple environmental factors the other day uh, they may change that's a beautiful question uh, thanks for asking who asked the question um, I, I don't see people who asked the question me uh, Maybe you will give your name uh, okay. yeah, we, we, yeah. We, uh, my name probably is probably Arash cannot see you uh, my name is Mitra Dehimi. I'm a GP. Thanks for the question. That's a very good question. Uh, that was actually my number one concern. You know, when you stimulate cortex, you don't know what are the senses that can be induced, right? So it is possible that maybe my monkey is hearing something too, or, or, or even worse than that, maybe the monkey is perceiving things in three dimensions, not in two dimensions. And I can only mimic images on two dimensions for the monkey, right? So, so this was my nightmare. But one thing I knew was that if that's the case, I would know right because the monkey has all the incentive to discriminate these trials from the stimulated trials so for example if the monkey listens hears something and then the monkey is like okay i'm gonna ignore this image because every time i do that they don't reward me and i just go with the sound and performs the task perfectly and his performance wouldn't be dragged down the trick is that we are 
tricking the monkey against reward. We are pulling him down the reward. So he has all the incentive to use everything against us, right? So, and and the point is that when we when we sort of the perceptograms are not hundred percent. So perceptograms are. I mean, everything, any, because the basic uh, false alarm rate is on the three to 4%, we go a lot more than that. We call anything above 60%, which is a huge effect, is a perceptogram. But some of them uh, would go to 100%, but not all of them. So for the perceptograms that are, let's say, at 88% false alarm, it means that they are very similar to what the monkey perceives, but not exactly, right? Because the monkey can still discriminate. There is that 12% residual performance of the monkey. That 12% can be coming from other senses too. It could be that the monkey hears something or feels something, feels differently, and is using that to perform that 12%. But the fact that it is the minority of trials suggests that even if it is there, it's a minor part of the perceptual effect. And the bigger portion of the perceptual effect is actually visual that can be captured by the, by the image perturbation. Okay, so, um, on, mom, yeah. Uh, thank you for your great uh, presentation. I want to ask about the uh, a space that you use uh, for your study. Uh, I understood that you use three-dimension uh, space. Uh, so, uh, and uh, you use the, the vectors. Uh, you told that uh, your previous study um, is the shadow of the vector on the, for example, x-axis. I want to know that uh, what is exactly x-axis, y-axis, and, uh, and z-axis in your study? Uh, I think it is uh, it uh, helped me to understand better. Um, while you were disconnected, I think there was a question about uh, that geometric uh, description of the perceptual space yes yes oh okay i don't know yes and i and i guess the question was about the nature of the axis on that diagram mm -hmm. can you elaborate on what the what each axis is so 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 the whole idea is that you could you could measure those as you could you could have a bunch of arbitrary axes to to describe them for example you could say luminance is one axis contrast is one axis size is one axis uh, faceness is one axis uh, and and you, the angle the angle in the field is an axis so it's kind of hopeless to try to name all those axes because it's a high dimension, it's a very high dimensional space. And that's kind of the point, which, which makes it difficult to even describe that high dimensional space. Uh, the one question actually, which is uh, in, in, in our minds, and we need to have more of these perceptograms to be able to address that, is that while we kind of don't know and don't care in a sense what exactly those axes are, we care how many are they, right? Are they in, in the order of tens, hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands, basically? So one thing that we have to do with this data, and we still don't have enough 
enough power to do it statistically is to once we have a lot of perturbation vectors because our basis space is a very high dimensional space it's again it's again a space so we are talking about uh, thousands and thousands of dimensions uh, but i suspect that the dimensionality of our system is actually higher than perception and uh, that's actually a very interesting uh, study that will be coming soon and that is about dimensionality of these uh, perceptual distortions uh, but again everything i've told you uh, today is very new fresh science and you gotta wait until uh, we do those things one by one or you want to hop on the train and help doing it okay um there is also one um online question i guess you can see it yes mm -hmm. if not we can read it for you can, yeah can you read one question is that if you only care about false negative errors in the performance or also the false positives were included and if they have any difference in significance i guess uh, the question is whether you also care about false negative errors or uh okay so if i understand Tans the question uh, it's it's about why are we optimizing for false positives and what happens if we optimize for false negatives uh, so if you take the question as that uh, that's an interesting question because uh, and, and actually that's an opportunity to talk a little more about this uh, you know ahab is a machine and it can optimize anything right and at the moment we should uh, i should actually elaborate that what it is optimizing on is not exactly false alarms remember the mistakes of the monkey are two types false alarms are the cases that we did not stimulate him and he thought we stimulate him and then there are misses misses are the cases uh, there are false negatives actually the cases that we stimulated him but he missed it he failed to detect the stimulation so if misses and false alarms grow together it means that the monkey is just generally making more mistakes uh, because because it's not a specific because because if i if i make if i if let's say uh, on a task, uh, my performance is at 50% at chance level, my 50% errors will be equally distributed between my false alarms and my misses. So we don't want to specifically increase, uh, we don't want to increase both of them. We want to specifically increase false alarms and keep the misses low. So in fact, Ahab's uh, loss function is that is to keep the misses low and increase the false alarms so now let's get back to your question what happens if we do the opposite right if we get the misses to increase and and uh, false alarms to decrease in that case we are you could say we are making an image which is the opposite of the stimulated image in the in the vector space and that's actually a very interesting, uh, uh, interesting image to study, particularly related to the discussion of dimensionality that we had a while ago. So basically, you could optimize either to increase false alarms. That way, you will be taking a picture of what the monkey perceives when you stimulate him. Or you can optimize for misses and keep the false alarms down that way you will be seeing a picture that cancels or is the negative of what the monkey perceives and then if you optimize for both of them to increase you will get crap you will get noise probably something some image that is basically makes it harder for the monkey to even detect the stimulation uh, which according to the earlier studies that was pretty much the gray image so it might actually fade away to gray uh so so 
depending on what we want to optimize, uh, we will see different things. And, and depending on what we want to see, we should optimize different things. But, but all of them are on the table. Um, there is also one more question, but before that, I, I take this opportunity to say my, my comment. Um, so I have a general comment about this whole uh, perceptography approach. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the promises of your perceptography approach is that eventually it will help us uh, understand how neural activity patterns reflect at perception and behavior, yes? Yes. Okay, so let's imagine um, we are um, 10 years from now uh, and um, you have done a lot of experiments on those poor monkeys, um, for example, in a given site in monkey, uh, you have obtained 100 perceptograms and you have re repeated the experiment in 100 sites, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is a dream data set for you, yes? Like mm -hmm. you have um, yes. 100 perceptograms in 100 sites. So uh, As a data set, yes. What? Yes, it's a good data set. Okay. So what is next? Like what okay. is your yeah. concrete uh, analysis plan to work mm -hmm. with, this, mm -hmm. with, with this data set? Because, Excellent question. Because yes. if you don't yes. have a plan right now, there is yeah. a serious yeah. question of whether this approach would be useful or not. Yeah, yeah. We already have a plan actually, and and we have made some progress with the existing data set. So so the plan is twofold. Uh, step one is that let's say we just have more uh, sites and more perceptograms, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that you see is that even in one site, when you feed different seed images, you end up getting different perceptograms. So question one is that, is there anything in common between them? Can we, if we have 10 perceptograms of 10 different base images from one site, can we predict the perceptograms that are coming from that site for other base images? So, so this is sort of a training, this is a training set and we have actually started that because, you know, we, we have like, uh, 30 something perceptograms, but for each of them, we've got thousands and thousand trials on the way to the perceptogram. So, so we are trying to train a system to basically learn what is the contribution of each point to any given image to basically generalize that over images. Number two step is to, is, and, and that will actually help us look at regularities in this space to see if there is what is in common basically and we can already pre predict it by better than, than chance actually uh, what would be the perceptogram for a new set of images for a given site number two which is the more important one is that how can we predict perceptogram from the response profile of the neuron from electrophysiology like if we record from those neurons, is it that perceptogram for, uh, let's say, for for example, we are doing it in the face neurons now because that's more of a uh, more of a constrained space now, and we kind of know these dimensions that the face neurons respond to, and we uh, if we know the dimensions on which the perceptual distortion happens, we have a shot at generalization. The goal is to generalize, basically. The goal is to generalize from, from neural selectivity to perception directly. And uh, the, there has been one example of success in this, in, in, the, in the vision science ages ago for the very low level color vision. If you, if you look up the CIE color space, that's basically the same concept that tells you how activity of each cone in the back of the retina translates into a perceptual color. 
and by by solving that code we could create the color display of course that's the lowest level of visual processing and now we are talking about the high level uh, of visual processing but the goal is to 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 make a space like that basically to map the two and to look up for mathematical homeomorphism between between the neural responses and neural response selectivity and uh, perceptual features okay i mean we can discuss more but i don't wanna um um f i like stop at one comment and question mm -hmm. so i continue with another uh, question um do you have any estimate for the resolution of micro led array and the stimulus uh, size needed to induce a desired perception for the monkey so I think uh, we are talking about the optogenetic simulation now. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, the yeah, so the resolution depends on the power that we use. Uh, if we run it at, let's say, uh, let's say 30% uh, power, which is the equivalent to uh, the fiber optic perturbing something about a cubic millimeter of the cortex. So it is like a hyper column of the cortex being perturbed. Although, although uh, that number is bigger for uh, wavelengths closest to red and is smaller for wavelengths closer to blue, basically. If we want to make it smaller, we got to shift to blue. Uh, the other thing that defend, defines, uh, affects that factor, that uh, parameter, is uh, the intensity so eventually we were prepared for those intensities but now we are driving the system with far 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 less intensities because because the monkey is actually capable of detecting far smaller perturbations so so the numbers that we are running now is about one tenth of that volume roughly so we have one more question in the floor. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thanks for your, your great talk. Uh, my technical <laughs> question uh, is, uh, why don't you use, you know, sample to match task uh, to improve uh, your per perceptographs? And my conceptual question is that, you know, I think uh, you are not, uh, we are not understanding uh, the perception of that monkey. We are actually uh, using perceptographs, making a stimuli that uh, make a very similar uh, perception in us, very similar perception to monkeys. So I think, you know, we are not actually capturing the subjective properties of uh, the monkey's perception. We are actually just making a stimulus, a stimulus or a set of a stimuli that are very similar. That makes actually us to have very similar perceptions uh, to that monkey. Uh, did I get mm -hmm. it right or not? Thanks. Yes, that's, uh, sorry, what was the first question? Uh, it's, it, it was about using a uh, sample to match task uh, to improve your pairs of graphs, yes. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, match to sample tasks can be used in this regard, but they come with some complications, uh, some, some behavioral complications that, that uh, in, uh, for the first shot, given, given limitations of time and many things, we decided to go with a detection task. And uh, yes, uh, I mean, and the main reason was that we, th we didn't think it is possible actually. Uh, but now that we know it is possible, that's right. One avenue to improve is to use uh, match to sample tasks, although they will be far slower. Uh, but 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 remember one thing that this is uh, fundamentally a match to sample task because because the monkey is also is the monkey is presented with an image before and after the stimulation. 
and uh, and the monkey is, is has has been trained on remembering a given image uh, and seeing if that image has changed to the memory memory image or not so so in, if you push it there is actually a gray zone between what we are doing and the traditional master sample task about the question that you mentioned the philosophical question that you mentioned remember we will ne i said we take a picture of perception i didn't say we capture perception or we explain perception and that is true in a any area of science remember even when you take a picture of the dark side of the moon you don't bring the moon down uh, home with you you bring a set of uh, uh, basically you bring an, a picture which is mathematically absorbing the variance of that phenomenon and it is it has equivalence uh, equivalent variance to that it is not that phenomenon uh, the <clears throat> There was actually, uh, because I was excited, I, I thought that this talk is in Farsi and I was excited about uh, talking in Farsi. I take the liberty to address the rest of this question in Farsi. Uh, apologies if there is any non-Farsi speaker listening. Mullahadi uh, Sabzewari معتقد بود که عکس نمیشه گرفت برای اینکه برای اینکه ماهیت یک شی رو نمیشه توی یک تصویر به دام انداخت و اون موقعی که بهش گفته بودن دستگاه عکاسی اختراع شده این میگفت غیر ممکنه چنین چیزی بعد که عکس رو آوردن بهش نشون دادن میگن قش کرد مولا هادی و یه دو سه روزی بیهوش بود بعد اومد با این فرمولیشن که خب این عکس که اون نیست که این که ماهیتش منتقل نشده در مورد پرسپتوگرام هم همینه مثل یه عکسه یعنی ولی دقت بکن برای اینکه ما بتونیم اون رو توضیح بدیم با توجه به فعالیت نورانی احتیاج داریم بدونیم اون از حداقل چه دایمنشنایی داره و اون وقته که میتونیم شروع بکنیم دایمنشناشو بریک داون بکنیم آخر آخر هم حتی اگه ما صد درصد وریانس اونو توضیح بدیم باز هم راجع به اینکه ماهیتش رو فهمیدیم یا نفهمیدیم میشه بحث کرد یعنی نگاه بکن در فیزیک نیوتونی هم ماده چیه ما آخرش میفهمیم ماده چیه یا زمان چیه نمیفهمیم ما فقط روابط بین اینها رو میفهمیم میتونیم توصیفش کنیم و وریانسشون رو در واقع Now I just switch back to English. Arash violate card policy sound. Okay, uh, I think we are almost uh, at the end of this uh, uh, this particular session. Uh, there is one general question. Yes. Uh, yeah, I have to thank you, Arash, for your fascinating presentation. Uh, there are actually two general questions that uh, we want to ask from all of our speakers. Uh, uh, first, in the field of neuroscience, and secondly, what role do you think women will play and how will they contribute to this field of study? Um, well, I... I I first answer the second question. Uh, the I, I think I think the 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 role women will play uh, depends on how uh, civilized their environment is, because uh, as you know, it is kind of a it, it's it's a it's a predictor of 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 progress actually women's uh, uh, women's participation in in uh, science and work and everything else. So so. Uh, I don't know exactly your question. Is it sort of uh, sort of a pragmatic question or, or theoretical question? Um, I think I, I think women have already played a big role uh, in in uh, systems neuroscience and and psychology particularly, and and I hope we get more and more women particip participation in both of these fields, and uh, <clears throat> so. I, I think that's kind of, um, <clears throat> again, an indicator of progress uh, for reasons that we can dig into in more details uh, off, 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 offline. Uh, the other question about the students, 
I don't know. It's sort of a weird question. Like, what advice do you have? Because it's a, again, it's a multi-dimensional uh, world. And and uh, what what am I gonna say? But one thing one thing that I believe is the most important uh, is to um, think about science as um, not something to pursue and learn, but something to build, uh, to think about science as a construct of human mind. Because uh, there are these two fundamentally different views about science. It's, uh, one, one, one is that science is something that you would kind of, uh, there is an infinite source of that somewhere. And if you are a good student and you keep learning from uh, Gahvare to, uh, until Gur, uh, you will kind of learn all the science and that's the way to go, uh, to keep learning and learning and learning. But I personally think that has a little bit of religious connotation in it, in a sense that the knowledge, the concept of knowledge in religion is, is something that is coming from above. And you kind of have to go and acquire a different attitude. That is the care's attitude. And it moves only at the speed of human mind. And if you don't take responsibility for that, who would get? So I kind of, my first advice is to change your attitude to science and uh, be confident about uh, 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 to do that, to make changes because at the end of the day science don't think about that like that we will remain followers uh, it is very easy to science to take that uh, mentality to the uh, throughout your entire career and you just follow and follow and follow and fill in the little gaps uh, but but um, but the mentality I am talking about is more aggressive and is uh, looking to change the world and is more confident. And I highly encourage that in, in anyone who uh, joins the field because it's a field of neuroscience. I personally believe we are still in the dark ages. Uh, there is no general systematic theory that binds psychology to neuroscience, for example, and in many other areas. Uh, so it's kind of really fun, actually, when you think about yourself as a pre-Newtonian scientist. Uh, that's how I imagine myself, and I take a lot of thrill from it. Uh, but but thinking that there is anything more than that is delusional, and I, I suggest uh, against that delusion. Thank you, Arash. Very wise advice. Uh, so... Uh, we can go for a short break and then we continue the symposium. Thanks a lot, Arash. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure to be with you. Sorry for the interruptions. Thank you, everyone.